This is WPSL Fort St. Lucie, the talk of the Treasure Coast. <laughs> It's 10.07 at WPSL 1590, the talk of the Treasure Coast, and you're on Ask the Rabbi, Dr. Doctor. And this is Rabbi Shafir Loeb of Congregation Eitz Chaim, your Jewish home on the Treasure Coast. So, I hope everyone is doing well today. Yeah. Yeah. So, so far, so good. So, yeah. Let's All right, I got to ask you. Yep. In, in lieu of the Supreme Court decision yesterday. Yeah. Um, you have always had, uh, at least in the last few years, pretty mixed classes, haven't you? Yeah. At both Kaiser and uh, yeah. IRSC. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, <laughs> I, I know there are people making a big issue about that, but... They it, haven't been part of the world for a while. You're right. And, and, you know, when we look at our, our like our scholarships, mm -hmm. like the Young Floridians, there's never anything about race anywhere um, uh, on there. I mean, it's, it's all GPA. It's, you know, uh, SATs. Um, you know, it's, I, I, I don't get it. I just don't get it. But, hey, it is what it is, I guess. Yep. And it's, it's all politics, I guess. Well, of course. You know, these right things get weird in a an election year. Yeah, you're you right. Know that. No, no, no. Yeah, you're right. I never even thought about that. But yeah, you're correct. People <laughs> get weird in an election year and they start playing on things that, that really don't matter to distract people from the things that do. You know, uh, uh, they were playing the old soundbite from Justice O'Connor. Mm -hmm. What was it, 35, 40 years ago? And and she said, you know, that she favored that at that time, but hoped within 25 years that wouldn't be needed. And I thought, okay. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. That sound makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It does. It Cra does. It does. It is crazy. It is crazy. So, so how was your week? My week has been pretty good, um, hectic. It's the beginning of a new summer B at IRSC, and uh, to, uh, today is the end of summer B, and the beginning Monday is the beginning of summer C at Kaiser. Wow. Okay. So yeah. All right. Okay. So now, what are you teaching in summer C at Kaiser? At summer C at Kaiser, I am teaching intro to cognition and can you say that on the radio yes i oh. can oh, intro okay. to cognition cognition okay yeah <laughs> so. okay so here's the really good part folks is that i figured out what was going on on my ipad um and the, <laughs> the other thing i'm teaching is uh, health psychology oh yeah. Interesting. Yeah. There are so many interesting psychology courses as you move forward. And I'm going to finish health, up this short one so psychology. that I can restart. Yeah. yeah health psychology. That's yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, uh, there's so much that, you know, goes into health now. And, um, you know, I'm sure you've got a lot of ethics involved and in our health care as well and yeah yeah okay so just like post for 30 days that's fine <laughs> uh, i love technology you know <laughs> what's it doing to you oh it's just being a real pain <laughs> oh that sounds like my week oh boy yeah it um just now thank you that's what we want I love technology when it works. <clears throat> Want to start the show again? Oh. Yeah, that's about right. 
you know, we and and they that. keep well, they keep moving stuff, and then they make you play games inside it. Oh, yeah. So you know, it's they're supposed to learn from you, and they do, right? So after <clears throat> years of doing Ask a Rabbi, you would think that it knows that we post this on Eitz Chaim and not on my personal business page or anything else. I love technology. <laughs> it's, yeah. It learns when it wants to learn, oh. and it ignores you when it wants to ignore you. Mm-hmm. What, are the, what does the I stand for in AI? Idiots. Oh, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> Artificial idiots. Um, oh. All right, so let's go ahead and let's talk about chat GPT. Oh, God. It's, yes. it's the Speaking buzzword out. of the week, right? Oh, I'll, I'll bet your students use that. Uh, and if they, if I can tell it from their post, because all they've done is cut and paste it, <laughs> then they're going to get a zero. Oh. Because chat GPT is not intended to, to, to do all the work. It really isn't. It's intended to give you the seed from which to work. And interesting. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't see anything wrong with asking it, for example, if I have to write a paper on swimming, what are the points I should cover? And it will give you a sentence or two about the different points you should cover. It may not give you all of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the other problem with it, of course, that is critical for students is that it sometimes picks up garbage because people have posted garbage on the internet. Mm -hmm. So you have to fact check. <laughs> One of the things that I did, uh, this is just the, the kind of person I am. I wanted to check ChatGPT and see what it was all about. And so I asked it, my husband is an expert on World War II, especially airplanes, uh, uh, weapons and submarines, ships, boats. He just, that happens to be his passion and he reads voraciously and studies voraciously. He could write a book if he put his mind to it. And so I asked ChatGPT a couple of questions about that period because I knew he would know off the top of his head what it was doing. And sure enough, it picked up some of the really off the wall myths and reported it as if it was fact. Uh oh. And so I'm going to invite students to think about that. The problem with chat GPT is that its intelligence, if you want to talk about intelligence, is simply in following the rules of how to write English. It's not in the quality of what it gets. What it's doing, folks, is it's doing that Google search in the background. It's gathering all of the information that it can about a subject good and bad, and then it's putting it into decent English. Not perfect, but decent English. It makes mistakes. And I wow. caught some of those. <laughs> so, <laughs> Okay. And, and things like Grammarly are going to catch some of those too. So if you're using both, they're, they're going to interact. Now, Grammarly I've heard of. Grammarly, well, Grammarly... When I was working on my second PhD, the university actually paid for a subscription for all the students to Grammarly because, candidly, it's very hard on professors to read garbage English. It just is. It's hard to know what the student really knows and what they're trying to say when the language is garbled. And very often, not only with second language speakers of English, but even with some of the primary English speakers, the language that they write down is far from fluid. And it certainly isn't academic. <sighs> That's another thing with chat GPT. It doesn't write in academic writing. So you're going to, you know, at the very least, you're going to lose points because it's written too casually. It's not intended to replace college research for students, but it'll give you great places of what to search for. What are some keywords to look for? That's a good thing to ask it. I want to do a study on um, neurodivergence, for example. Then ask it, what are some key terms that I might search for to find the journal articles I need for a study on neurodivergence? 
And it'll do that. It'll give you some of the, it'll go in and it'll ask Google, what words do people usually search for? Now, I will mention this. When I say Google, Google, of course, is the common word. It used to be uh, way back when, Yahoo, remember? <clears throat> No, when the dinosaurs I'm not that were old, out, I'm yeah, sorry. Uh -huh, right. <laughs> he just probably didn't use a computer back in Yahoo. <laughs> oh boy, I do remember right Yahoo. when Google replaced, um, yeah, Yahoo as a search engine. So that's one piece of antiquity, folks. But there is something on the web called Google Scholar. I've never heard of that. Huh. It's a subset of Google, and it it researches only in in scholarly sources. I wish it had some more settings than it does because it tends to bring up far too many dissertations. And dissertations, folks, even though they're looked at by the committee of the student, they really are not peer reviewed. They really are not, and it shows many times because sometimes the committee just wants to move the student along. <laughs> you know, I had a prophet Loyola, you, you talk about grammar. And um, if he saw improper grammar, D, right off the bat. Yeah. And, and no questions asked, get a D. And it was like, oh, bro. Yeah, you might be able to get by with one or two mistakes, but not. Oh, no, no. <laughs> if even, even a couple with this guy wow. was impossible. Wow. Yeah. Well, hey. You know, you do have to be able to communicate what you're doing. And it's, we judge the intelligence of people by their language skills, folks. It's just, it's a societal thing, and it's not just America. We're very bad for it because we have mostly English speakers in America. Mm -hmm. And I say mostly because not everybody. My grandmother never got proficient in English. German was always her first language, and she came over as, as, as the mother of adult children. So she lived in a community of, of German-speaking immigrants. So for her day-to-day, -day, she functioned just fine in German. I don't know how my grandmother, who was an Italian grandma, uh, spoke German, too. <laughs> I'm just thinking. Because in I, Europe, they speak. You're right. You're right. It's yeah. not uncommon to speak five or six languages. Exactly. Because you have to do business. English is not one of them because English is across the channel. So for the, the local who's not planning on international business or something like that, needing English is not important, but you do need Italian, German, French, and Swiss. Yeah, we, we had a player at IRSC um, this last year from Spain, and he was multilingual, I think six languages. Yeah, it's not uncommon. Yeah. Spanish is another one. Portuguese. Yeah. Lots of, de depending on where you live. Right. So, for example, when I spent some time, a brief amount of time in Luxembourg, Luxembourgish people speak French, German, uh, Swiss, Belgian, because those are the countries nearby. And if you think that sounds outrageous, go, go on the Internet and have them overlay Texas over Europe, and you'll get an idea, A, how big <laughs> Texas is, and B, how small European countries are. Yeah, oh, yeah. They really are. And, and as I, I've, I know I've talked about it other times when somebody said, oh, this person has a Fiondan accent. And I'm like, it's 20 minutes away. But you could get to very different accents in Florida by driving 20 minutes. Well, I don't know about 20 minutes. but Oh, sure. Just drive. Go up to, to the Panhandle. They don't even speak English up there. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was kind of cute. Um, I'm a member of, of a Florida service organization who has chapters all over the state and the different chapters send you different uh, publicity pieces that they're doing and our secretary was reading something that was from a group in Pensacola and she said oh, Pensac nobody's going to go there because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, yeah, it, it's what eight hours six hours I don't know uh, it's eight hours by bus I can okay. tell you that so six hours by a steady car yeah yeah Unless it's long. It's, it's, a, it's a while. Yeah. You're not going to go there for an afternoon tea and then drive home. Probably. Probably. Unless you really, really like to drive. I'll tell you that uh, Air Force Base uh, right by Niceville where we have the state tournament is mind-boggling. And the stuff that goes on on that base 
that you know they they had um, uh, as I was told Iraqi pilots over there right mm-hmm. at the very beginning okay. of the Iraq War uh-huh. um, up in northern yeah. northern Florida training. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. You bet. Yeah, a lot of stuff. Well, yeah, and if you go to Emory Riddle, you're still going to find oh. all kinds of foreign students. Oh, you bet. Yeah. And you know. At, even at IRSC, we have some foreign students, and Kaiser has some. Everybody has some. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's good. We learn a little bit about their culture, and they learn quite a bit about ours. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I, I, think, I think it's great. I, lo- I love diversity. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's marvelous. I, th- I think that one of the benefits when I used to teach the Chinese English, one of the big benefits for me was that I learned a lot about Chinese culture of many different types, and there are many different. I could, I got, by the end of it, I could pretty much tell when I got a new student where in China they were located by various, th- either things that they said or things that I saw in their room or stuff like that. The culture is so interestingly diverse. They're a mosaic as well, as, as are we. And I think that one of the other things that happened with that and probably one of the reasons that China got unhappy with it was that they learned a lot about America. Yeah, yeah. Right? They learned a lot about what we have in the way of freedoms, and neither system's perfect, folks. They're just different. And, But I think that seeing that, that Chinese live in apartments for the most part, because they're overcrowded in their cities, mm-hmm. and it's yeah. only the very, very wealthy who live in homes, or if you live outside the cities you'll be in homes some of the poorer villages but to see the american homes because we would talk about homes and we talk about rooms in the home and i would draw a layout of my house and show a picture of the front of my house with and typically two cars in the driveway and that's a sign of great big wealth in i'll China. bet oh i'll bet yeah. whereas here you know there are some houses in my neighborhood that my husband and i jokingly refer to as parking lots because they just have so many cars they have adult children Mm-hmm. Whoever else living there, and we've proliferated in cars. When I was doing the research on the Seminoles, there was a, one of one of the women who did an oral history on uh, on YouTube, and you can find those. She was talking about when they first got the land reparation money. That it was typical. You could tell a a, a Seminole home because there was a Hummer in the driveway. It was one of the first things they did was go out and buy cars with it. Big cars. Big yeah. cars. Yeah. Hummers are definitely big cars. And when I lived in Ohio, the people um, across the street from the jewelry store that my mother had had a Hummer. And it came in very handy one time when I tried to go around a fallen telephone pole. And I caught it just enough that it whipped in. And it was between my front and back wheels. Oh, no. <laughs> and the Hummer actually pulled it out. Real yeah, Okay. Yeah. yeah, he put a chain around it and <laughs> out it went. <laughs> so that was handy. Did it do any damage to your car? No, no, it didn't. Okay. Uh, it just, it was a case of I had just, there wasn't really enough room to quite get around it. And the way that I caught the very tip of the pole and the way it was balanced on the ground, it, it, as soon as my tire went by it, it flipped in, and it was a good two or three feet under my car because it just pivoted on whatever point it was resting on whatever boulder in the parking lot that was actually holding it. So it was able to move, but there wasn't enough room to move it out. So he had to go into the neighboring parking lot and pull it off and, and out. It didn't have any wires attached to it. I'm not quite sure how and why it was even there boy that brings back bad memories of uh, the twin sisters in 2004 and wilma in 2005 <laughs> driving around phone poles and stuff to get uh, to work oh boy yeah yeah, yeah those are yeah. and it, it had been like after a, a snowstorm or an ice storm or something mm-hmm. and i don't I, again i don't remember it might have been that that pole was actually used in my neighbor's driveway to to um mark the lanes because they were often used for that i just i don't remember i I didn't think anything of the pole and i I knew it had moved 
something that I that I thought I could get around it. You're right. There there were older homes in in Hollywood that had the poles yeah. as, as, as as markers as as lane markers. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. they work. Uh-huh. Sure. <laughs> They're handy. You can't just move them when you don't want them there. <laughs> That's right. Unless you have a Hummer, in which case you whip a chain around it and pull it off. But. <clears throat> Oh, boy. And, of course, he wasn't bothered by a telephone pole either. He could go right over it. Of course, now you have to ask, is it going to be the electric Hummer? Mm, there you go. That'll be an interesting time. <laughs> oh, brother. Yep. Oh, by the way, um, of course, it didn't happen in your old state. But in New York this week, wood-fired pizza ovens were outlawed oh, okay. to save the environment. Carbon emissions, huh? So, uh, yeah, I, I would imagine sometime in the next uh, three or four weeks, we'll see about 5,000 pizza store owners moving to Florida. Yeah, that'll be an interesting <laughs> thing. <laughs> I Some of the laws are just incredible. Some of them are. It's, it's, you just think, how stupid can we be? Oh. All right. How do you live without wood-fired pizza? <laughs> You survive. You survive. You survive. All right. This is as good a place as any to say, folks, if you'd like to ask a rabbi a question just about anything. And we do have a Jewish holiday, by the way, coming up uh, next Friday, the the fast uh, that commemorates when the Romans bridged the wall of Jerusalem. Because back in those days, we had walled cities. Mm-hmm. And the Romans would camp around a city and and isolate it, lay siege to it for two years, starve it out, and batter away, batter away. And if they couldn't batter away, then they built a a ramp just by piling dirt. And they they didn't care because they had slaves. Wow. (laughs) So. Yeah. That's amazing. It It, it is. And then you think of what's going on with Russia. Um and their conflict, and you think, how in the world? we? It's like, have we progressed at all? I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, it just, it's amazing. I mean, you've talked about Alexander the Great and yeah. how horrible he was, and you think, you know, you could list despots on the, in, the, in uh, the world now, and there's at least five or six of them that are just as bad. Yeah. We All haven't right. learned anything over 2,000 years. We haven't learned enough, that's for sure. Yeah. Wow. We haven't learned enough. I'm trying to figure out what's going on with my... my. Uh, um, okay. Your Wemo's on. Yeah. Mevo. Mevo. That, that's a great little camera. It, that, it is a great little camera, but I'm not quite sure what it's... What its problem is today, but may may not be happy. Something's not happy. Something's not happy. So, anyway, if you'd like to give me a call, five seven seven two three four zero fifteen ninety. I was about to give my f- cell phone number out. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to wait a half hour to give her a buzz on her cell. Phone. That's true. She doesn't answer it during the radio show. So, how are the new digs? The new digs are working out fine. They really are. So it's uh, it's a nice space. Uh, I will tell you that people are actually enjoying. We we don't move the, the they've got tables out for the for the uh, it's the Alzheimer Center during mm-hmm. the day. It's an Alzheimer Center, mm-hmm. and at night it becomes us. And so everybody in the congregation was like, "Don't move the tables. We'll just sit at the table." And they're liking that. Yeah, <laughs> because you know, they put everything on the table. They can lay the prayer book on it. Sure. Because we don't have what we don't have yet. We've got to work on this, but we don't have the big screen so that the service projects. And that's okay. Mm-hmm. We'll work through all that. Mm-hmm. Sure. We will work through it all. So, yeah, it's a busy week of summer. Classes ending and starting. I'm just finishing marriage and family therapy. That was a fun one, too. Family therapy is probably one of the hardest therapies to do because the the counselor the therapist is looking at 
two and two or more individuals, depending on whether they're doing couples therapy or family therapy. Mm-hmm. Family, there's even more to attend to and watch all the details. And when you're dealing with a couple, you're not only just dealing with what's on the sofa in front of you and what those issues are, but you're also dealing with all of the unresolved traumas and and attachments and things like that that affect people throughout their lives. You know, and every family has one form or another. Every family problem. has all kinds of, of issues. Sure. And as I point out to people, every parent damages their child. Children don't come with instruction books tied to their toes when they're born. And even if they did, nobody'd read them because nobody reads any instruction manuals, she said with a blatant overstatement. <laughs> What's an instruction manual? Yeah, when all else fails, read it. Sorry, that's a guy thing. <laughs> no, it's a people thing. <laughs> what, what do you mean directions? I don't need any directions. Well, now, the, the last couple of things that I've purchased, I just purchased a portable juicer so I can take it with me, take the fruit whole and make it fresh. Oh, wow. Okay. And the instruction book for it is a, about a three by five card written in microscope. Oh, <laughs> that you, you, you need. Oh. Yeah. So I asked my husband to scan it. And enlarge it. And please. enlarge it. Right. <laughs> so that I can actually see it. Oh, yeah. So I get that. It's uh, especially the older you get. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. The eyes seem to definitely want the glasses more and more. Uh, yes. I get that. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. It, even with the eye surgery last November, mm-hmm. I sense my left eye struggling again. Ah. So now you might need a tune up. Oh, I just, I've got glasses in the other room. So I'm, you know, when I'm on the computer, I've got my glasses on. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah. So <laughs> eyes are amazing things and we need them. And kudos to the people who function without good sight. Ooh, yeah. Because we take up so much information visually. On the other hand, it also blinds us to other forms of, of input. I remember we had a fellow, actually, he's over at, uh, IRSC at uh, WQCS, Joe Leonardine, who was visually impaired. Mm-hmm. And um, actually, our original PSL board is in engineering. And what he did was write um, Braille strips mm-hmm. over each one of these pots. Yeah. And he, he was had, fine. He never missed a beat. Yeah. Never missed a beat. You know, and you think, okay, the other senses are really, really yeah. working. Yeah. Well, and then there are amazing individuals like painters who are blind. Wow. Yeah. Sure. So that's not... There are other ways of taking in information. And what they'll tell you is that the colors feel different. We had an audio engineer at ESPN early days. And on our first stereo football game, Mm -hmm. he was working. And perfect. Mm-hmm. All he was working off of were VU meters. Mm-hmm. Perfect telecast. Yeah. And you think, wow, this is amazing. And he couldn't hear anything. Yeah. It, truly amazing. Yeah. So we can take in all kinds of information. I guess the best way that I personally can understand that is that my depth perception is less than perfect. Much less than perfect. And and yet I flew, hmm. which people go, how can you fly without depth perception? That's intriguing, yeah. And the answer very simply was that I had learned in learning to fly, I learned other visual cues that told me when and where I was as far as height from the ground and things like that. And I still use compensation even when I'm driving in, in traffic and stuff like that. There's lots and lots of other clues besides just your depth. Boy, I thought of you the other day watching nightly news and that Delta Airlines flight 
that lost its nose cone, mm -hmm. and he brought it in beautifully, and <laughs> nobody injured at all. And and I was thinking, I immediately thought of you on that. Uh, some of your flight stories. Oh, and and when I was a flight instructor, I used to stress to pilots, both those that I was doing annual checks and for those that I was instructing, that if you're going to go in to be a pilot, if somebody's going to pay you to drive that bus, mm -hmm. then you're not being paid for the hours and hours of sheer monotony where everything's working. You're being paid for those times when everything isn't working. So let's practice those. Let's keep those skills sharp. Yeah. And there are times when you don't let the autopilot land the airplane and just supervise. Because too many pilots do that too. And then when you've got something like the nose cone, it's not going to get the right inputs. It's just not. And that's where the person who actually flies the plane, even if it's just in the simulator, right, who has those skills. And that's an interesting thing because when I, when I was getting my L-1011 simulator certification, one of the things that one of the instructors said to me is, how are you able to land so smoothly? And the answer was that I was using the visual cues even in the simulator that it was giving me because it doesn't have as good a depth perception. That Lockheed plane was huge. Yeah. So you were certified for flying that? I didn't take the last ride because that was several thousand dollars. Okay, gotcha. So yeah. I didn't get actually get certified, but I went through the training. I got a scholarship for the training. I just didn't have a spare five grand kicking in my pocket back then. Wow. Don't have it now. Yeah, because I mean that that plane, that's that was larger than a 737. There was in in Pittsburgh. There was a simulator for that, for that airplane. Wow. Okay. There are simulators all over that pilots theoretically can use when they're on the ground between flights. They can go and log a couple of simulator hours to keep themselves current, and so there are simulators all over, and this one was what they actually did is they had a little camera that you flew. There was a room with a camera. Now it's all digital, but but then it was, they actually had this little tiny camera on a little scale. And so out, somebody outside the simulator could actually see how you were flying inside mm -hmm. by just watching how the camera operated. And the camera, of course, fed your windows inside the simulator so that you saw what was going on outside. Sure, sure. It was actually kind of cool. It was fun to watch, fun to fly. Wouldn't want to be flying now, though. Yeah, it's, there are challenging times flying. Well, and, you know, and, of course, now we've got the big FAA shortage. That, and, and, you know, I think what we're running into is, um, A, pilots. Mm-hmm. And, and it was interesting, I guess MSNBC the other night had a panel on um, pilots' retirement age mm -hmm. of 65, or should they push it up to 70? And three of the five pilots said, there's no reason for me to retire. Yeah. I if, have not lost anything. If their health, if, if they can pass, you go through a rigorous health exam to keep your license, and so these are not um, unhealthy. Nobody's hobbling into the right into the cockpit. People are strong and vibrant, and people are strong and vibrant longer today because we do have better medicine. The senior citizens are the fastest growing demographic in the country in the world, in part because of antibiotics, which have helped us with so many diseases, and also cancer treatments and, and all of the different things that have turned terminal illnesses into chronic illnesses. But along with that, the people who are healthy, who are able to fight off the infections, who are able to conquer the this or conquer that, it's we're getting better at those things. So people are living, they're not only living longer, but they're living healthier mm -hmm. longer. Mm-hmm. 
And, you know, yes, there are things like diabetes that are chronic and that if we don't change our diets are going to long-term be a major problem. And some of those are manageable. Many more things are manageable. And still people can stay strong and vibrant and healthy even with those situations. The other big thing, and I'm going to just go out there on the limb and chop it off, is that <laughs> we need, we really need to do an overhaul on how the medical pharmacological in industry thrives on treating symptoms and not curing. You think? I think. It's where they make their money, and I get that. And they, there needs to be some way for the herbal meds that still work and are still so great to be combined with the pharmacological ones so that th there is a healthy profitability there. And that's going to take a sea change. I know Dr. Scheip used to talk about that, and he's Eastern medicine type. And he said, hey, folks, these herbs have been working in China for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And they work. They do. And you don't have to pay thousands mm -hmm. of dollars for uh, tablets. No. And it's always one of the interesting things when I go into a doctor's office and they say, well, what prescriptions do you have? And I'm, None. I do take a ton of supplements. I, you know, I don't like taking pills, but I do supplements because the American diet just, it's not, the same. It's not healthy. No. It's just not healthy. Even if you go to the store and you buy fruits and vegetables and you eat a lot of those and you get healthier range raised uh, protein, you're still going to end up without the nutrients that you need because the soil... In 1920, the government said the soil was depleted, and the only thing we've put back in are the things that make the plants grow big, not the things that make them grow healthy. Thank you, Monsanto. Yeah. And it is a challenge of where the money is in, in the process. But most of what you get in the supermarket is water, because that's what makes the plants big and, and fluffy, is water. And you don't get the trace elements. You don't get the nutrients. And and then the second key is how to get a good supplement that actually is going to be bioavailable that your body's going to be able to use instead of just passing through and going out the other end. Mm -hmm. That and I think that I'm hoping that the transition to gummies to make it easier for people actually has a secondary effect of keeping some of those nutrients available. But I'm not even sure about that. I, I know that I, I... I have a problem with that because of the gelatin. Yeah. It's, yeah. There's all kinds of problems. But, uh, so actually asking a company, what's the bioavailability of your nutrients in your supplements is an important question. Mm-hmm. There are, there are a number of studies out there that talk about different vitamins and different supplements. And there's a huge difference and in general, the ones in the supermarket are not your best choice. They're just not. They, they don't invest the money in making their vitamins as soluble, as healthy for the people taking them. There's a secondary problem depending if you take too many supplements, you can actually age yourself by producing antioxidants if you're not taking a good vitamin. Mm -hmm. If it can't absorb it, then as those non-digestible minerals pass through your intestines, they bang around and create free radicals, which messes up your metabolism. Mm -hmm. So it's hard. It's not an easy thing. It does take reading the label. It does take researching. And that's candidly something that companies rely on customers not doing. Yeah, that's why I like Joanne's show so much uh, and talking about nutrition and and her store is uh, is so unique, and you know, and, and you talk about the difference between what you carry and say what Publix carries, that's five dollars less. Well, and she said they're totally different products. Yeah, <laughs> they really are. They really are. They're just yeah. they're just not, and it it makes a huge difference. We've learned a lot about that. And willful ignorance, though, is the shady marketer's best friend. Bogo. 
<laughs> Bogos are great. Yeah, they're fun. But don't buy what you don't need just because you can get two of them mm-hmm. for the price of two. Uh, marked as <coughs> that, never mind. Naturally. Yeah, mark it up, then give him the, yeah. Yeah, then give him a BOGO. Yeah, exactly. And then once a month you don't BOGO it, and then it's horrendously expensive, but then it's BOGO again next week. That's right. Um, (laughs) Yeah, it's, I can remember my husband one time saying, I only buy soda or pop or what carbonated beverages, Coke, whatever you want to call it, not just Coke, but all of the different varieties. And... um, he was looking at one store that had a BOGO, and he said, well, the BOGO price brings it down per bottle to about what it is at this other store. I said, it's because the other store doesn't do BOGOs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Amazing. Yeah, you know, Tanstaffel, there ain't no such thing as free lunch, folks. <laughs> well, it, you know what's funny is how different uh, Carol and I feel now. We have not had soft drinks, and I mean... Um, we always had, a, a pe- whether it was a Pepsi or Dr. Pepper in mm-hmm. my case, um, we haven't had one in almost seven or eight months. Wow. Feel totally different. Yeah. I, I, totally different. You, you you see, my big vice is coffee. This is water. Is yeah, co- water is what, uh, 99% of what I drink is water. Yeah. I ha- I'll have this thermos of coffee through the day, and that's, it's the, it's whatever I didn't drink in my coffee cup before I left home gets in, ends up in this or a smaller. Th- this is my big thermos. And then I have a smaller sizes depending on how much of it I drank before I left the house. So how much coffee do you drink? A day? It's the equivalent of two cups. That's nothing. Yeah. That's, that's I would think. And the rest of what I drink, and not enough of it, is water. Mm-hmm. Us too. And uh, I enjoy water. There's, I, I like the spring water better than the purified water. But interestingly, if I can just get a little bit of spring water and put it in the purified bottle, then I'm fine. I just I need some of those trace elements, apparently. And that's a guess on my part. I don't know that for sure, but I'm guessing that's what my tongue wants. So, yeah, it's an interesting world we live in. We don't get enough trace elements, even if we eat healthy. And so supplements definitely are, are an important part of it. And I think that's why I'm not on prescription. That and, and some blessings from the genetics and keeping myself in shape. Some of it's luck. I admit that. Absolutely. Now, your husband, is he um, relatively He's relatively free? Hel- he, pr- pretty much. Um, he's got a blood pressure which is not uncommon. Yeah, I was going to say. And yeah. that's why I said I'm, I'm genetically lucky. Not that, because my mother had high blood pressure, but my father did not. So fortunately, I must have gotten his gene on that. You never know which parents you get and how they combine and who does what. But that's right. It's always a crapshoot. <laughs> it really, <laughs> really is. It's so true. And, uh, and he got the high blood pressure piece, so he has that. But other than that, no, he's pretty, he's not nearly as... He doesn't have the 15 million pills that people have to organize. And I think that you get on that roller coaster when you have a chronic condition and then you end up taking meds and then you get a side effect and now you're taking a med for the side effect from the drug instead of looking for a different drug that's oh, watch, without the side effect. Watching television and you see these new drugs... And then you hear the side effects. Oh, there's something minor like stroke or death. I mean, it's like, really? Oh. Well, hopefully not too many because then they'll lose all their customers. Yeah. Oh, brother. Yeah. But there are there are known side effects on some meds that are just really questionable. Challenge comes with the way that the FDA approves meds. It's a challenge because the... the Fox is guarding the hen house. Mm-hmm. Has for and, years. And yeah, that's the way the system is set up. And I understand the reasoning behind it. And yet we still need to, we need to have a discussion about that and come up with something that holds the companies more accountable. That's really what it's all about. The way that it works now is that the company that wants to get a drug approved 
presents to the FDA their drug and a placebo and use that in a study. And the problem with that is that they control what's in the placebo. So it might not be, let's say the drug is XYZ that does something. And it might be a really effective drug at doing what it's supposed to do, but in order for it to be effective, it needs a non-active ingredient to be its catalyst. It's got to have the presence of, of ABC in it. But ABC has all of these side effects. And so they put ABC in the placebo so that they're, quote-unquote, testing the drug. And then you're going to get, when they report the study of the experimental group versus the control group, the control group, of course, is going to have the same side effects because it's got that non-active active ingredient in the pill that it's taking as the placebo. And that's how they get away with a lot of this stuff. The, and because the FDA can't prescribe the placebo for all of these studies, I think they could do more toward that. But it's it would take a lot of follow-up and inspection and, and holding the companies accountable. It's much easier to say, okay, company, you produce a placebo and you produce the active pill and the active ingredient can't be in the placebo. Well, then let's work with how we define what's active and what's not. Well, they have some of these new cancer treatments that are something like $10,000 a week or something. And I'm thinking, my goodness, um, hopefully it'll save lives, but uh, frightfully expensive. For, for those that can afford it. Yeah. Yeah. You bet. You bet. And, of course, a lot of the uh, being, quote, unquote, experimental, not covered by insurance. Right. Right. So it's only for those who can afford it. And, and a serious question becomes, how much will they work? And how many of them will you take before you realize that it isn't working? So there's there's a whole lot of stuff going on in that. And that's why they're experimental. And that's part of why they're expensive, because the drug companies are paying for all of that research. And we need that research. We've certainly come a long way. My, my, fraternal, my paternal grandmother died of breast cancer at a time when there wasn't much treatment for it. Now, how old was she? That's a good question. I'm going to estimate probably about 30, 35. Oh, yeah, yeah. She um, was just a kid. Yeah, well, my father was 10 when she passed. Wow. So, and he wasn't the firstborn, but she probably started having children slightly before she was 20. She was pregnant quite often. She had many, many kids. She had three sets of twins. Oh, wow. So, oh. So she was... You know, cranking babies for a while, and that probably contributed. <laughs> that would kill you. <laughs> yeah, and, and it probably did contribute. But that was common in Europe in those days. Mm -hmm. People didn't do things to not have babies. And, uh, yeah, that kind of baby making definitely has been costly for women over the millennia. What can I say? Yeah. There's, there's a euphoria with having a newborn baby in your arms. There's no question about it. Our bodies are designed to do that for us. We're hopefully learning some things. But again, cancer treatments are better. They're still far from perfect. They still take people out. But we're doing much better with it. Mm -hmm. how, ma how many people are vibrant and healthy today who wouldn't be here if cancer treatments weren't able to remove the, the cancers to uh, give different treatments. Sorry, we've got chemo, we've got um, radiation, we've got uh, sorted, which brings a whole new meaning into the prayer that Jews say at the High Holy Days, who by fire, who by water. Yeah. Mm. Right, so you can think the radiation's fire. You bet. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, and, and I always point that out when we get to that prayer, that this might not speak just to death. It might also speak to what treatment your cancer needs. 
And we live in an age where so many people are going to have, in the, court, in the, in the length of lifetimes, are going to have some cancer. And my heart goes out to those parents whose children oh. have a cancer that can't be treated. That's why I, when I see the St. Jude commercials, I just think they work miracles in yeah. Memphis. Yeah. They just do. Yeah, it's uh, one, of my, one of the classes that I'm taking right now, I'm actually dealing with the subject uh, of cancer bereavement, which is the families of those who are taken by cancer. It's a particular kind of bereavement. It's different. It's different. And, um, yeah, we need, we need actually to have better support of parents who lose their child the number of marriages that survive that event is very small. There's very, no, very small. I can't even comprehend losing a child. Yeah. It, it's, it was just Well, so it, it, among other things, it, it doesn't feel, it feels so unfair. Right? The kid is supposed to live longer than the parent, supposed to be there to take care of you in your old age. And if it doesn't, so not only is the loss of the the child the loved one a piece of it but it's because it quote unquote isn't the way things are supposed to go and the reality is we can't live life expecting things to be as they're supposed to be in our master plans in our master yeah. plans <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 and so the question of you know why is god doing this it, it's not that God's doing it. That God does it because that's the system. But it's not that God picks that family to bring grief to. It's just you look at a rose bush and some roses make it to beautiful maturity and some don't. And it is just the way of nature. That sounds pretty harsh and that's a rough tone to end the show on as I hear the music in the background. So I guess the biggest thing I can say, my heart goes out to anybody who's in that group. And to anybody who's lost somebody, grief is one of the more wicked emotions that we work with. And wishing all of you who are feeling it some healing and uh, recognizing that life is for the living and that our job as survivors is to make life meaningful for ourselves and for others. And with that, I wish everyone a pleasant Friday, a good week, and I'll see you next Friday on the Fast of Tammuz. And uh, what time is your service? 7.30, and we're at 295 Northwest Prima Vista Boulevard at the Corning of Irving. You're going to have to go north on Irving and then turn left into the parking lot at St. Andrew's Community Center. All right. Building.